Hello and welcome to the Buckets and Tea NBA show. I'm your host, Catherine Niker. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode. Today, we've got, you know him, you love him. I probably introduce everyone that way, but it's true. It's Louis Zatzman. Uh, hey there. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad that people know and love know me you just and like love everyone you. else. <laughs> I really need to like make the intros a little more unique, you know, but you're, you know, you're, you're a Raptors Republic regular Mm -hmm. as well as many other places, but you're also Mm -hmm. just telling me that you've been able to experience this NBA playoffs a bit more as a fan, which must be nice. Yeah. Gone out to a couple bars to watch some basketball games with friends, which I never get to do, which is awesome. Um, Lakers fan when the, the, in, in, Game four, when they were eliminated, this Lakers fan at a bar was super belligerent. And as he was walking out, he was really drunk and bumped into my friend who was sitting. And then he Uh tried to fight my friend for bumping into him. He was just sitting still. He was just drunkenly wanted. It was hilarious. We just made fun of him until he left. Um, I love it. You never get to do that when you're working. (laughs) Yeah, you don't uh, bump into fans in the the little media room. And then break out into fight. Although that would be fun for me as someone who is not there. (laughs) Yeah. Fights in the media room would be fantastic. Yeah. 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 Um, But, you know, that's 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 so many guys in sports and, you know, they put all their, you know, emotional well-being into their into their sports team. And the Lakers, you know, not the worst pick. At least they've won multiple times. But. You know, that's a that's a dicey road. That's a dicey road. Emotions and sports. Funny thing. And it's funny. I mean, I don't know what your experience is. If you have found your emotional connection to sports lessened by working in it. Mm -hmm. I definitely have. I find myself caring a lot less. Um, You know, I still really enjoy the job, but it's just very different type of emotion. Um, What's it like for you? Well, I've never been like. I don't know. I've never I've never wanted to punch someone because my team lost. <laughs> <laughs> so I think my my emotions have always been a little different as right. a sports fan, but uh yeah, I think maybe I've become like I don't know. I I I feel like I've become more cynical. Does that make sense? Mm. Less like, optimistic and hopeful, and it could work if just one more. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So if anyone's yeah. wondering why the media is so cynical. <laughs> well, that is one of the qualities of fandom. It's this really awesome mixture of eternal optimism and unbelievably powerful cynicism. Mm-hmm. It's, it, but those, like, you, it's amazing that those two can be melded together, and yet that's what fandom is in a way. Uh, and, yeah, I think I just don't have – either of those qualities it does make it less fun and you know to circle back uh it's nice to be a little optimistic and cynical watching a game and not caring you know it's fun well yeah i mean it's probably been different for us too as raptors fans like not being in the playoffs i feel like i i'm not like stressed yeah like even though like i loved winning a championship like it was kind of stressful (laughs) Very stressful. <laughs> like all Very those stressful. games, like I just, you know what I mean? There's a lot of stress happening there. So, you know, it, it's kind of, obviously I would rather, would I rather be stressed? Is that what I'm saying? I think I'm saying I'd rather be stressed. But Yeah. You know. I mean, it's also stressful for me because so much of my income is tied to the Raptors being in the playoffs or like the box, for example, because I write for the team. When they got knocked out in the first round, my first instinct is like, ah, how am I going to make all this money up that I would have got from writing about all their mm-hmm. playoff rounds, um, which sort of makes you akin to like a degenerate sports gambler. Right. Have you become one of those? I mean, I don't gamble, but if that's my inst- if that's my first reaction when a team loses is my own financial you know, consequences, then I mean, I guess I have become one of them, even if I don't gamble. Damn. Damn. Well, this took a turn, Jobs. but I think I, I I'm not going to sports gamble. I've decided I'm not going to do it. Like, I just feel like even quote unquote as experts, if you watch their picks, if you follow their picks, they're often wrong and they literally do this for a living. So it's like, I also don't get joy from that extreme level of stress. I that's, I don't find that fun. I find that awful. I have no interest in sports gambling. 
Yeah, like I think if you make like a couple bets and you're just having fun with it and you've like accepted that you can lose this money and it's not stressful for you, then that's cool. But I think like if experts are only batting like 52 to 54 yeah. percent, then then what am yeah, I going to You got to consider the money lost if you're going to enjoy gambling. Yeah. Um, okay, well, that's our PSA. Uh, <laughs> let's get into the finals. Uh, we're recording this on Thursday, June 8th. We just experienced a historic Game 3 win by the Denver Nuggets. We had two players with triple doubles, uh, which has not happened before, ever. Is mm-hmm. that right? That's with thir- right. With 30 points. Did I get that right? I should have had this open. Um, it's true both with... It's just triple doubles, I believe. No, no teammates have ever had triple doubles in the same game. Right, and then and then Jokic had thirty points, twenty rebounds, and ten assists. That is insane. Also, a record set. Also, a record set. It is just, I, uh, I really, even though it, it ended up being a, a blowout at the end, I really appreciated this comeback by the Nuggets. And also at halftime, it kind of felt like it could be anyone's game still. Yeah. And I remember thinking to myself, like, let's see if Mike Malone can make the in-game adjustments in a finals. Like, I feel like that's a real test for a coach, you know, if they can do that. And he did. And they ran away with that win. And I feel like people who picked Denver and five are feeling pretty good right now because whenever Denver does win, it's always such a dominant win. Where like when the Heat win, it's like, wow, that was a great game. But when the when the Nuggets win, it's like, oh my God, the Heat don't have a yeah. chance, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh I think part of that is Jokic is just clearly the best player in the series. And I mean, he's he was even the best player in game two when the Heat won. And so if you're going to beat the best player, you kind of have to do it around the edges. You can't like win down the middle. And so heat wins are going to look grimy, close games. They also just broke the record for most close games ever played in a season, right? So they, they're just, that's how they play anyway. Um, but yeah, Jokic. So when did you start watching basketball? What, what are your earliest memories of conscious, con- like watching basketball? Like 96, 97. Okay, so mine, mine is like the very You're aging me. Oh no, no, this matters. It's not. Um, <laughs> I'm just mine kidding. is Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Um, and so uh, and Shaq, and so I was thinking watching Jokic, where Jimmy Butler hit a pull up three in the fourth quarter, and it was like, oh, maybe Miami will come back. This is last night, game three, and Jokic immediately, like very early in the shot clock took a semi-contested three, which he never does. And it just seemed to me that it was a, it was a spirit breaking shot where he was like, mm. maybe you hit something cool. I, I, I can just do it. It's no skin off my back to do the same thing. And it was very much an anything you can do. I can do better moment. And I was thinking back to players who can do that. You know, lots of guys succeed even at the highest level, even in, in the playoffs where you can succeed by doing all sorts of things, but very few guys succeed by, saying, oh, you did that, I'm just going to do it better for fun, just to break your spirit. And I remember Kobe doing that. I remember LeBron doing that. And I think Giannis had a couple of those just through athleticism, not really jumpers, in his finals. And that's all. Like, Jokic is the only person other than those three that I can ever remember having a a run where he's like, I can just absorb whatever you're doing and I'll do it all better. Uh, It was incredible. It was it was an unbelievable performance last night. Um, Yeah, I agree. It's definitely historic. But I feel like, you know, Jokic, like his attitude and his like approach to the game feel different to me. Like a lot of people have been making like the dunking comparisons, which I feel Mm -hmm. uh, make a lot of sense where like Kobe Bryant was like. I will shoot us out of this game if I, <laughs> and then, you know what I mean? Just to have that moment, just to be that guy mm-hmm. where I don't feel like Jokic or Jamal Murray are really cut that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like they like, like those guys really like wanted to be assassins where I, yeah. and winners obviously, but I feel like these guys are just kind of like, we just want to win. And it sort of doesn't matter who has like that heartbreaking shot. Like as long as we have it, you know? Yeah, I mean, Kobe was – that was late Kobe shoot you out of the game. 
Early Kobe was well. Early, yes, early, right. early Kobe. I think shot them out of a a playoff series against. Was it was it the year San Antonio won? Yeah, back before they started winning. Everything. Before they had their three yeah. in a row. Yeah, yeah. Kobe yeah. had like an infamous like fourth quarter like meltdown where he kept missing shots and like wouldn't pass the ball. My strongest memory of Kobe in the playoffs. I was a, a Phoenix Suns fan, obviously because of Steve Nash mm. as a kid. And it was the Suns playing so well. I just, you know, Steve, I, I actually don't even remember the play, but I remember Kobe went down and hit this like hanging, floating layup where like he was so well defended. He had to like adjust and shoot it from like over and he was falling down and just threw it up there and made it. It's like, how can you beat that when mm-hmm. you have to work so hard and this guy just can do anything and it, and it works. And uh, yeah. And that was, that was Jokic last night to me. And it's funny cause you're right. Where he doesn't, he usually is like, okay, I'll pass because that's what the play calls for. But last night it wasn't, he wasn't doing what the play calls for. He was just like, I'm going to do the most impressive thing I can. That's what last night felt like. And it felt like a departure from his usual approach to the game. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think like both stars in this game realize that like this is – I hate when people say must win because to me, like every playoff game is a must win. Yeah. But I think they realize like this is very important and this is going to dictate the series. And they really like went after it with that approach. And so I think he realized like sometimes he has to have moments where he just takes over and he did. But also, I mean, Jamal Murray had a phenomenal game himself, right? Like he also had a triple double. I don't know why my stupid Google keeps giving me season stats and not last night's stats, but mm-hmm. I believe he had 37 points last night. Um, no, that's Saturday's game. God damn it, Google. Please, everyone listening, I'm so sorry. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> I, I clicked on this one article and I was like, yeah, this will have everything. And then it betrayed me. So <laughs> that's where yeah, I'm so- at right now. So That's last night he had 34, right 10, and 10. There we go. Thank you, Lewis. And then Jokic had 32, 21, and 10 assists and two blocks. Yeah. I said yeah. 30 and 20 before. But in any case, uh, a historic night by the two of them. I love the two of them. I was wondering, are they are they the best pick and roll ever? Whoa. Uh, oh, That's what crazy. I'm wondering. Are they the best pick and roll combo ever? Um, they could be. Okay, so who are their competitors? So Probably Stockton Malone. Stockton Malone, Nash Stoudemire. Statistically, uh, the best pick and roll combination over the last every year, the best one over the last three or four years is Trey Young and uh, Clint Capella. Uh, <laughs> and the second best over the last several years is Trey Young and John Collins. Yeah, um, they just over and over again keep being the most efficient. So, I I know that it doesn't, it shouldn't be a competitor, but I honestly think Trey Young and Clint Capella should probably be at least mentioned as an honorable mention uh, of the I best mean, pick and roll ever. I mean, they've been the best pick and roll duo, I believe, in the history of tracking data. Wow. I can check this though. Um, who else? Who do you think? Who else? Would no, be? I believe you. I believe you. I'm not. I'm not saying it isn't them. I oh, just well, now feel I like need to go into second spectrum database. I'm, I'm just check, saying so. with these who two in the finals. I mean, they're. I mean, it looks like they're going to win a championship, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, Stockton Malone didn't win ultimately, so yeah, I feel like right. this puts them that into matters. a category that makes them. I mean, and like these two triple doubles both with 30 points like i feel like this is pushing them into the stratosphere of best pick and roll but in all fairness to lewis i did not put that in my little rundown earlier so we (laughs) are doing this research on the fly now but yeah somehow trey young always manages to insert himself in our podcasts this is uh two of two Okay, so database loading. Uh, okay, historically, I think Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, uh-huh. was magical in uh-huh. Lob City. They were, oh man, they were so much fun. I, they probably weren't the best because I remember that team. I think DeAndre Jordan was actually a better, like statistically, pick and roll partner with Chris Paul, but the Blake Griffin pick and rolls were just way more fun. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, except for that one iconic dunk. That is DeAndre yes. Jordan's legacy. <laughs> Was that Brandon Knight? Yes, I believe so. Yeah, just got, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, just, God. just R.I.P. Yeah, that was a, that was a rough <laughs> moment. <laughs> that, was a, that was a hard moment out there. Um, oh, you know what? How about something like Jason Terry, Dirk Nowitzki? That would be a similar thing where maybe they didn't own regular season after regular season, but they did win a championship, just murdering LeBron James and the Heat and Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, just over and over again because they just could not stop. Dirk catching in the short mid range, kind of like Jokic last night. Yeah. Where a lot of the time, you know, they, they switched the screen angle last night. So Jokic was coming up a little lower. So Jamal Murray had a little more space with that push ahead dribble. And so he draw both guys and he had that pocket pass into Jokic and he was catching with no one around him at the free throw line. And he'd often turn that into a couple steps to a floater. And that's a little bit what Terry and Dirk did where Dirk would catch around the free throw line, which a lot of guys short roll to pass there, where they catch and they like take a moment and form up and score. Dirk was more shooting. Jokic was floating. But uh, yeah, similar like means of finals winning. Um, okay. I'm not my, my, the second spectrum is not, I'm sorry. No, I think that's great. But I, you know, even with Jason Terry, I, I mean, he's not Jamal Murray. He's not Jamal Murray. Or at least he wasn't when but he was. I, but that might be the closest comparable in recent yeah. basketball in a finals. Certainly yeah. in a finals that, that won a championship that we have. That's kind of wild. Yeah. I mean, it's it's you're right, though, to draw a difference between just like regular season efficiency and just what these two have accomplished together. Because the other thing uh, that's going for Jamal and Nicola is – they're playing one of the better defensive teams we've seen in the playoffs. Miami's been able to turn off the tap for everyone they've faced until they've faced this two-man game. They just cannot find a way to stop these two guys running a pick-and-roll together. So, man, yeah, it's, it's been pretty incredible how unstoppable they've been. Do you think – I mean, you know, Spolstra is obviously a great coach, and, and it's really impressive that Miami has gotten this far – uh really loved their adjustment to take Jimmy Butler off of Aaron Gordon and have him uh guard Jamal Murray like that was obviously like the big difference in game 2 um mm-hmm. do you feel like this Miami Heat team has a- any adjustments left um yeah definitely but i, I don't hate to phrase if- it that way but no i mean there's always things you can try and i'm sure our coach is meeting you know, after a loss, for example, you would probably have, if you were writing down, like if you're like, okay, like thing to try number one, this, two, you probably get like, you know, 50, 60 th- things people bandy about, but number of like things that they will actually put into practice in a game is a lot more limited. And so I think having more size on the court was an obvious one, right? Because Oh, yeah, like bringing Kevin Love in there, yeah. Yeah, 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 starting Love. Because versatility is such an important thing in the NBA. You know, we see it with the Toronto Raptors where they just were not, despite having a lot of defensively versatile players, they weren't really a versatile defensive team last year. And the Heat, with only having one guy who could guard a center in Bam Adebayo and only one guy who could guard a power forward in Jimmy Butler, they were locked into a very strict way of playing defense. And bringing Love in, you know, maybe he could buy some time against Jokic. He could buy some time against uh, against Gordon. It allowed them to be a lot more versatile to try different stuff. And Mm -hmm. you know, it worked in Game Two. But I, you know, other ways that you can buy versatility, I don't see them at the expense, or I don't see them without other expenses. Because what makes the Heat the Heat is crazy player movement. Just guys sprinting around screens, handoffs. And, you know, slipping, like Max Struess, Duncan Robinson, um, Gabe Vincent, these guys have mastered off-ball movement, much like Jamal Murray, right? That's mm-hmm, what was making mm-hmm, him so mm-hmm. incredible there. And if you say, okay, they're all small, maybe we try a little more size, you lose the thing that makes you dangerous in the first place. So maybe you would hold Nikola Jokic a little more in check if you can be more versatile, but you're not going to break 80 points, right? You just don't have a chance. And so uh, the, like, 
adjustments they can try a lot adjustments they will try that's a lot harder to think of anything Mm -hmm. um what do you think is going to happen with this series like what's your what's your prediction uh okay so i think the heat will probably find a way to steal another game they just they're too their offense is working too well i think they were held to what like 80 something points last night. Um, I know I should have this in front of me. They scored uh, 94 points against the Nuggets last night. Uh, yeah, 109 94. Yeah. That's not what they're like. That, that happened against the Knicks. But if they had scored 94 points against the Bucks or against the Celtics, they would not have won that series if they'd averaged that. And those two are better defensive teams than the Nuggets. Uh, and so I think we can probably expect them to have another game where they just get it rolling from three point land. Uh, maybe they'll hit 17, 18, 19, 20 threes, and maybe they can just at least slow the game down enough. They won't turn it over, keep it in the half court. And who knows, maybe that's enough for a win. I don't think that's enough for a series, but um, the, the, the heat are just playing such a tight brand of offensive basketball that we won't see what we saw last night. They created, I, I read this somewhere, I forget where, zero wide open threes against the Nuggets last night. They averaged about 10, you know, maybe like eight to 10 a game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that's just, mm-hmm. that's not going to happen again. Um, the Nuggets played a really good defensive game. And so I think Nuggets in six, that would be my guess. Yeah, no, it's great. Like I, I was originally going to do Nuggets in five, but then, uh, on last week's episode, uh, Samson convinced me that it would be Nuggets and Six. And then I was like, okay. Oh, he said the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I was like, okay, I'll do Nuggets and Six. So we're kind of on par. Uh, we, yeah. We're we're sort of on track for that. And honestly, like, I feel like when I think about Jimmy Butler, I just feel like he doesn't, of course, he wants to win a championship, but I feel like he isn't that player that, like, needs a championship to solidify a legacy. Like, to me, he's a legend, you know, like, and I think that's like kind of obviously not the same type of player or anything, but on par with like Allen Iverson or like he doesn't have a championship, but he's so well regarded as like one of the best and like one of the coolest guys ever. And I just feel like we'll look back at Jimmy Butler and be like, man, that was like one of the coolest guys that like ever played this game. Absolutely. Um, You know, a lot of people uh, have qualms with his um, actions as a teammate, you know, what he did in, in Minnesota on the way out, um, yeah. what he, you know, Chicago, um, Philadelphia. But the thing about that is he is what we ask professional athletes to be, right? Our, our, our request, a very unfair request, is just prioritize winning above all else. Um, and that's just what Butler embodies, right? He, he has definitely thrown his teammates under the bus at times, but it's kind of been for not valuing winning as much as he has. Uh, He has been like the wet dream of what the blogger wants from a pro athlete, Uh, (laughs) you know, always being the underdog. This will be his second final series. This is Mm -hmm. his, he's gone to the conference finals once or twice other than that. Right. Last season they were in the conference finals, which everyone seems to forget. Like, the guy, for despite being on consistent underdog teams, also was the bet the best team that the championship Raptors played. Mm-hmm. You know, they that wasn't the conference finals, but was a much stiffer test than the Bucks were that playoff run, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or the or the Warriors, Warriors. But that's um, you know due to injury, probably. Yeah, that's different. But but I mean, he just consistently is better in the playoffs than he is in the regular season on underdog teams. What more could you ask for from a spectacle, right? It's 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 a show. He is entertainment personified, just like Allen Iverson was. I agree with you. I think that's a wonderful call. Um, do you think Jimmy Butler is Michael Jordan's uh, secret son? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no questions there. No, I have. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> what more do you need? <laughs> <laughs> uh okay just a little more nba news before we get into raptors offseason stuff mm-hmm. um the suns the phoenix suns announced that they are officially parting ways with chris paul uh which means i believe that means he will be a free agent 
So we saw a bunch of different... But it's a bit confusing. Yeah. So Chris Haynes broke the story and said they're waiving him, which would make him a free agent. But Chris Haynes seems to have been wrong. Oh. And both Woj and Shams tweeted later that they're exploring... Or Woj tweeted they're exploring their options. Very milk toast. And Shams tweeted they're (laughs) considering sign-in trades. And so to me, it really showed why do you care about being the first... Like, being the first is not that important. What's important is getting the information correct. I don't know, in other journalistic fields, there's an expectation when you um, rev- when you break news, you need two distinct sources confirming the story. I extremely seriously doubt that that is an expectation in sports. I assume these guys get a text from an agent, immediately tweet it. They don't waste time confirming anything because they're racing against each other. And very often the only purpose of these guys is to beat the team press release by four minutes. Cause the team's about to tweet what had happened for, and it's ridiculous anyway. So I think Chris Haynes, um, did a bad job, bad job by, by breaking the news incorrectly. <laughs> anyway, that's not the real meat of the story. The this story, is, this is media cynicism here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, you asked about Chris Paul. I'm like, here's why the media. Um, uh, I think, I mean, he's still a valuable player. Uh, he has not had a wonderful season. Uh, actually, quite a poor season. Even going into last year's playoffs, the adjustment that the Mavericks made to beat the Suns, or, yeah, the Suns, was we're going to attack Chris Paul on defense, put him in pick and rolls. And he just could not keep up with Doncic. Not big enough. He not impactful enough. I don't think that's ever happened to him in his career. Just being targeted like that on defense. That's a big change for a guy like Chris Paul. And this season, he was significantly less effective um, across the board on both ends. I still think he is val- He's a really good player. Like he, he he knows what's going on. Really smart. He does a lot of the point guard stuff you want calls plays. Um, he's not really able to like run an offense to perfection anymore for huge stretches of a game. Um, I get why the Suns would want to move on, right? You, you want a championship now and it's really hard to ask Chris Paul to be your backup or something. Um, but it's a lot easier for a new team to sort of work that out. Uh, I think a lot of teams should want Chris Paul sign and trade should be very feasible. There's no reason to waive him, but yeah, I think it unfortunately makes sense. And this is just what aging does to guys, you know, yeah. I mean, it's impressive that he is still playing. I know anytime somebody's playing beyond the age of like 36, yeah. I'm like, yeah. damn. Um, yeah, I mean, there are like, I've seen some circling, like, should the Raptors consider Chris Paul stuff? How do you feel about that? I mean, the Raptors are an unbelievably um, – cash strapped organization not in that they don't have money this mlsc has infinite money they can print it but just in terms of the the financial situation with contracts coming up and in free agents so look if you can maybe they waive him maybe he's a free agent and you can offer him the, the the max you could offer him and maybe he'd take a bench role if all of those maybes come true he would be unbelievable on the route he would solve so many problems but if one of them doesn't come true, I don't see why it wouldn't, why it would work. Like, right. I doubt he is a free agent, full stop. And then I doubt he would take, you know, the, the mid-level from the Raptors. He'd probably prefer other teams just to compete. You know, he'd probably want to, he could play for any team he wanted. He'd probably want to play for a team like Golden State or, you know, or Denver or something like that. Or something, Lakers. Yeah. Um, let's say he does choose the Raptors. Uh, there's... The Raptors would not be a championship contention team if he was their starting point guard. So I don't know why he would want to do that. And why would the Raptors want him to be their starter? It wouldn't push them further ahead. So maybe they'd need a different starting point guard. And that's like so many maybes. So, yeah, I get it. He would help the team if a lot of things break their way. I doubt those things break their way. Right. Um, I agree. Speaking of which... Uh, let's talk about some Raptor speculation. Uh, again, okay, we are recording this on Thursday, June 8th. I told Lewis, I was like, watch the Raptors hire a coach the second we start recording 
or like before this episode gets released tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like just my luck. That could happen. Um, Who seems to be rising in the ranks right now is Sergio. Is it Scoriolo? Yeah. uh, Yeah, I believe it's Scoriolo. Yeah. Uh, Who is still coaching in Italy Mm -hmm. right now. So if he is the person they want to hire, it would make sense that that hasn't been announced yet. Because his season, I believe, goes till June 16th. Wow, you've done your research. So I think I try. Thank you. So uh, if that is the case, that makes sense because he's competing, I believe, for a championship in the Euro- in the Euro League right now. Mm-hmm. So if that is the case, then all then it all comes together and it all works. Um, if it's someone else. I think the this long wait has been a little, I don't want to say bizarre, but unusual. Okay. But maybe it's fine. Like, I feel like there's a lot of like, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty around why it's taken so long to hire a coach. Um, mm-hmm. Do you share that sentiment? Do you not give a shit? Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. No, I, I think... Look, when Masai Ujiri held his press conference after they parted ways with Nick Nurse, he said it was going to take a long time. And all the coaches that have been hired, none of them really were what I would expect the Raptors to have wanted. Um, like, Monty Williams is a, is a really good coach. I don't think he was the type of coach the Raptors wanted. Um, and, and the same Adrian Griffin, um, again, really good coach. Uh, I think the Raptors wanted a new voice, a fr- you know, fresh face. They wanted to sort of clean house. Um, yeah, I think so too. I and, think, and oh, so sorry, time. There's no like, why? What is the loss from taking a long time and really doing your due diligence? I don't. I don't see more. There is a negative. very specific type of anxiety that Raptors fans have, and so the, the and negative it, is it and it shows anxiety. itself. It shows itself, right? I think all Raptors fans yeah. can agree. There's a very specific anxiety that we have as Raptors fans. Um, if it is Sergio, uh, I believe he will only be the second European coach to be hired as a head coach. I read David that this Black. morning. Uh, no, he's from Israel. So I guess that You're is right. It. Yeah, he coached in, yeah. Uh, his um, name is like... Was it Igor something? Hold on. Yeah, I'll pull yeah, it up yeah, as yeah. we talk. He coached the Suns. Briefly. There we go. Yeah. So yeah. he was the only other European coach to be hired as a head coach. So one thing I was thinking about is, you know, obviously Sergio was a part of our championship team as an assistant coach. Um, I, I, I recall this is like deep in my memory bank that Nick Nurse was – talking to the team this is during the championship season about like you know something he experienced while coaching in europe and Kawhi leonard was like are you about to tell us a story about europe do you remember that um yeah i do think i I don't remember exactly but yes like i think there is a real stigma there not saying it's right or fair or any of that I think there's a real stigma there and I'm curious, you know, I don't feel that way, certainly not as a Canadian, but I think like, you know, when I think about, you know, American entitlement, sorry, but true. And then somebody like, you know, a Scotty Barnes, who is only like what, 20, 21 years old was not a part of that championship season. I don't know to what degree he feels connected or tied to that championship at all. Like even on an emotional level, I'm so curious how he would respond to somebody like Sergio. Really good question. Uh, It's hard for us to know, right? We're talking in generalities. Of course, yeah. European coaches. But we just have no way of knowing how Sergio as an individual interacts with people. I mean, he looks looks like a extremely – the type of person you would listen to. I'm not sure how (laughs) – (laughs) <laughs> he looks like the type of person you would listen to when they start talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He looks like he um, commands attention. He looks like he yeah. has the finest leather jackets. 
He looks like he's in the mafia. That's how I would put it. Yeah, yeah. But I think he, you know, I don't know. He, because of the butters. slicked back hair, he has that slicked back That's mafia right. hair. But, you know, I, I, I feel like he might have like a slight fashion game to him. Oh, yeah. I just remember he has like the, these nice leather jackets. And I'm like, okay, he might have some swag to him. Uh, yeah. You know, who knows if it'll be him or not, but he's rumored as the front runner right now so, it feels like there's somebody new every week honestly uh so i have a couple so about that anxiety um oh okay here we go space, right not having a coach is a liminal space it's transition um and you can't see either doorway on the end of the hallway right one of those creepy horror movie hallways like a liminal. <laughs> um, and that's what that's the space we're in um there's no actual negative like a hallway won't hurt you in real life but it still can be uncomfortable to be in one. So that's, that's why there's anxiety. Um, but, but it really plays no role in terms of actual competitive um, um, pros or cons. And, and so, but the, the thing to me, I think that is most important that the Raptors might've lacked. And this is something that Adrian Griffin really um, emphasized in his process with the box is coaching is not just about X's and O's. It's about relationships. Um, it's about, knowing players as people, especially in today's NBA. 30 years ago, players didn't really expect you to take an interest in them as people. Today they do. You really do need to, to, know, to know them, to support them. Um, and, and that's something that for all of Greg Popovich's um, orneriness with media and his incredible age and um, seemingly um, rich guy hobbies like wine tasting has actually done a really good job <laughs> of connecting with his players and just being a normal human being with them. Um, team building activities, right? And NBA and something- wine culture is like a whole thing. Off the on charts. Yeah, yeah. They're all weird rich people. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so, but, and so uh, the Raptors have missed that. They have, they have missed a lot of deep rooted human connections. The, the idea of this is a family that died when they traded DeMar DeRozan and that's fine when you win a championship, but now that they're not competing for a championship, they were really missing it. Uh, and so who knows if Sergio uh, would be able to connect with players. You would hope it's, it's important, but what really is important to me, you know, guys, another stereotype about European coaches is X's nose tactics. Europe is, you know, considered a more um, coached league in that there's more X's and O's happening, less freedom for players on the court. Um, a lot of innovations in the NBA come from Europe in terms of what plays people are running. The Raptors just fired one of the best techni- tacticians in the league. Like Nick Nurse, here's an example. The Raptors consistently rank among the best in the league on efficiency on out-of-bounds plays. Out-of-bounds plays, to, or t- after time, pardon me, after timeout plays or out of bounds, either sideline or baseline, either of those possibilities. The mm-hmm. Raptors, despite having a terrible offense overall, have been the best in those circumstances because those are the only circumstances when coaches actually call plays. Out of bounds and after timeouts, which is out of bounds. Um, in the play-in game, Toronto, and this is from Second Spectrum, Toronto averaged 2.0 points per possession. They scored every single time after a timeout. That's insane. That's like unbelievable coaching. Nick Nurse, you're not going to get a better X's and O's coach than Nick Nurse. Um, And yet was not the coach they needed at the time. So I would hope that they aren't trying to hire a tactician and stop. I would hope they emphasize relationships. Um, And that is something that um, Jordi or Jordi Fernandez is, um, I've heard unbelievable things about his relationship building. Um, even though he's not the front runner today. And I just don't know. That's something I haven't had a chance to talk yeah. to these guys about or see in action, but that's what I would value if I were hiring a coach. Um, you know, playbook is good. You know, you want a good playbook and all that, but I think there's a lot more to coaching and I hope the Raptors don't um, ignore all that other stuff. Um, I think that's very well said. Uh, I was like, man, imagine, you know, we just did this whole thing breaking down like Sergio and then like Steve Nash gets hired before this podcast comes out. (laughs) (laughs) Just my luck. But uh, no, I think that's very well said. And I agree. Like I was like leaning, you know, when this first happened, 
I was leaning towards like a Jerry Stackhouse or somebody. Whoop, my yeah. mic did fell. Relationship guy. Yeah, like a relationship guy, a former player. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like somebody who could really connect to them on a different level. I feel like that's the type of voice I would envision them hiring. Although, you know, I don't claim to be more of an expert than they are. So I'm a little surprised by the Sergio thing, but uh, exactly for the same reasons you mentioned in terms of relationship building, but that's not to say Sergio isn't a great coach or that he's not capable of that. It's just, it's just, we don't have like, solid examples of that is that fair to say i mean, i have no idea yeah. what his relationships were like when he was an assistant all like, guessing at coaches is just guessing because because of exactly what you said we don't know what his relationships were like as an assistant they could have been phenomenal or not we just don't know mm-hmm. um we and, yeah. and you know you people who really follow his coaching now would have a better idea cards on the table i haven't done that and so a lot of conversation about coaching is just about uh, it's in a vacuum. It's about what we prioritize as values without knowing whether people actually have those values or not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's life, right? They're, they're, that's what media is when it gets to talking with coaches. Um, let's move on and talk a little bit about Fred. Um, awesome. I have to give the uh, the No Dunks crew uh, credit for this because they refer to this time of year as NBA silly season. And mm-hmm. I thought that was the most perfect way to put it with uh, trade and free agency speculation underway. A lot of people are saying that, you know, Fred Van Vliet is going to opt to not do his, uh, sorry, to opt into being a free agent. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think in a, in a year where there aren't a ton of free agent prospects i think he's going to be really high in demand lots of rumors around him going to houston uh there's some philadelphia rumors out there i think there's a lot of teams that would love to have a guy like fred and with you know the fan base and also media and other people like kind of unsure what direction the raptors want to go in right now um how do you see this playing out uh, I think it's quite likely Fred opts out of his deal. Uh, and I think, well, he'll make a lot more money if he does. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of teams that'll want him. Fred's a really valuable player. Um, and I think probably there's teams that will value him higher than the Raptors would. Um, because the Raptors are neither a rebuilding team with tons of cap space like Houston, nor are they a championship contender whom a player like Fred could be the final piece like Philadelphia, um, which leaves Toronto in a very difficult position. You know, they could, they could match any contract they have, or no, no, he's an unrestricted. They couldn't match obviously, but they have bird rights. So they could, they could resign him uh, to any contract they so desired. Um, but I do think there are like, I don't think they would pay a max contract for him. And I think other teams might, So uh, that leaves Toronto in a very tricky situation. They should hope that he's uh, more likely to go to Philadelphia because if it's Philadelphia, they don't have the cap space to sign him out, right? Um, Without juggling. And then maybe Toronto could, you know, finagle a sign and trade and get something back. If it's Houston, they have all the cap space they want. They could just sign him and Toronto gets nothing. Um, I think ultimately Toronto will really miss him. If he goes, they don't have point guards on the roster, not ones that are capable of, you know, running an offense. Mm-hmm. He is a hugely valuable player, even if he's not what everyone might have wanted from a starting point guard. He was incredibly valuable to Toronto to the extent that virtually every advanced stat pegged him as Toronto's best player last year uh, and the year before. Um, and I think the year before that as well, ever since Kyle left, um, advanced stats have consistently said he's been the Raptors best player. I don't agree with that. I think Pascal was their best player last year by a wide margin, but it just goes to show I would agree. a lot of fans have this notion of Fred being this guy holding the team back. It's very, very far from the truth. Um, he might not be a championship caliber or starting point guard, but without him, the Raptors would lack a huge number of his skills. Um, so if the Raptors do lose Fred in free agency, they need to replace a number of his skills, his off-ball movement, 
um, his pull-up shooting, his catch-and-shoot shooting, even though they weren't the best in the league, they're still among the best on the team. Um, you know, his, his rebounding, his um, defense in the gaps, turnover forcing, um, just calling plays, being point guard. There's a ton of stuff that they don't have guys who can replace that on the team at the moment. And so uh, if Fred does walk in free agency, the Raptors are in a really tight spot in terms of how to build the team going forward. Yeah, I feel like this is the first time in a long time where, and I'm sure other fans agree, that we're, we're just like so stumped when it comes to this team. Like, what are they yeah. going to do? What direction are they going to go in? I mean, I feel like, you know, when the when the Jakob Pertl trade happened midseason, you know, he was really punting a lot of that responsibility uh, in this offseason to see what he's going to do with the team. And, you know, they they traded next year's draft pick. Right. I don't think this as much as people are like tank, 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 tanking. You know, if you follow a tanking team, you realize how terrible tanking is and it lasts a lot of years. It's not like, oh, you lose for one or two years and then suddenly you're in the playoffs again. Like, you know, it ends up being like a five to six year like long haul. Um, So I don't think they want to do that. But I'm also like, I don't have a clear vision. Yeah, that makes sense. Is top six protected, the pick they traded? That's right, yeah. Which sort of means if you're going to be bad, you got to be really bad. Really bad. And if you're not going to be bad, you may as well be good. Um, losing Fred would sort of indicate that either you just lose your top six draft pick and you're, middle, you're mediocre again if you keep everyone, or maybe you sort of do more trading. They're, they're in a, a real crossroads where the, the draft pick in particular indicates that you don't want to ride the middle of either of these crossroads. You want to choose the extreme ends. The extreme end of contending is very difficult to see uh, at the moment. You know, maybe Damian Lillard wants to be traded and maybe Toronto is the best package. Maybe they're the Portland, they the all that Portland stuff for him. rumors. The Portland rumors are so intriguing to me because there's there were even first then. Was, yeah, go ahead. No, no, at first. No, I was gonna say, I mean, at first I was hearing a lot of like OG and an OB for this like number three pick that they have this year and blah blah blah. But then a lot of people were saying like that is not enough for Portland's yeah. end for that pick. Like it would have to be Siakam or somebody like that. And I mean, the idea of Siakam and Dame playing together just as an NBA fan is kind of amazing. But also, like, I would hesitate to give up Siakam for this number three pick because to me, like, I'm very high on Siakam because I'm just like, I feel like he is the reason people ever feel inspired by sports. Like, you think about where he came from and where he is now. It's like that is why you tune into sports. That is why you root for That's people. Right. And you attach the stories to people. Yeah. And I just feel like the fact that he is an all-star player. I mean, he he deserved to be an all-star this past season. It was just our record sucked. But yeah. he absolutely deserved to be an all-star this year. I just I don't know. But if that's the direction we're going in, then I accept that we're going young and that's just what it is. But it, it's not something I would just say like immediately, like, yes, do it. And that's the thing, right? Let's just say it happens. Let's take Portland as the example on both sides of the coin, right? Okay. Maybe Toronto decides to tear down and you trade Pascal Siakam to Portland for the number three pick. Are they bad enough to, to be within the bottom six teams next year mm. with Scotty Barnes, OG Ananobi, Jakob Pertl, hopefully. Hard mm-hmm. to say, right? Mm-hmm. It's not guaranteed. That's They're still really talented players. You'd still need to do work to really make the teardown as valuable as it could be. Or let's take the other side of the coin. Maybe instead of trading your best player to Portland, you trade for Portland's best player. Maybe you trade for Damian Lillard. Are you good enough to to make losing next year's number six pick matter because you're in playoff contention? That's also hard to see either. So I think it's like you're at a crossroads where the two roads are quite thin and it's very difficult to get onto either one of them. And Toronto has an extremely, extremely um, 
tight windowed path in front of them this off season. And I think that's also a reason that we're in a, an uncomfortable liminal space right now because the coach is the first domino. What type of coach they hire tells us what type of plan they have for the future. Mm-hmm. And we still are left guessing at what type of plan it might be. Right. Right. Well, you know, with that being said, I, uh, I, I'm really hoping that we do get some sort of answer to that soon because I'm really looking forward to seeing what this team does, putting these pieces together, seeing what I make of it. You know, it's been so many months of speculation at this point. Yeah. Um, there was uh, an article I sent you from Bleacher Report that rumored that Masai himself is not happy in Toronto and that he's frustrated here. I haven't heard or read that anywhere else, but because it was Bleacher Report, I thought, okay, like they're not not a reliable source. You know what I mean? So I figured it's worth talking about. Have you heard anything about Masai not being happy? Um, so I, I don't want to make this seem like it's reporting. This is not reporting. But I heard it um, theorized that the reason why Toronto didn't make any trades last trade deadline was not because – Masai thought it was the best path for the team, but because ownership perhaps said no to whatever trades might have been. um, Oh, wow. That's possible. But from what we know, Masai has total control of the team. Um, He has lots of um, priorities outside of the basketball court you know, Giants of Africa, his charity work. And he's made it really, really clear that he values helping his community um, outside of basketball. And he has had the freedom to do that in Toronto Um, to an extent that um, I think it would be very difficult to assume he could do that with any other team. Um, His last contract um, promotion to vice chairperson, um, from what I understood, came with carte blanche. Like it's just his team to do with as he will. Um, And perhaps small, tiny ownership share. I'm not sure about that. Don't, don't quote me on that. I don't know. But like, I, I, it's possible he's unhappy, but it's based on what we know, it's very hard to know what he'd be unhappy with Um, because the team is his, it's his um, canvas. Uh, Yeah. I mean, sorry, the last thing, everything he said to the media is he's happy, right? Um, when media asked, he's continually been rumored for this Washington job uh, yeah. or also for jobs outside of the NBA politics or, or other, you know, commission. Yeah, Bleacher jobs. Report was saying that Washington is going to consider going after him again. Yeah, he's continually been rumored for these over and over. And he's always said to the media, I am in Toronto. He has never, he's been very clear. I am not doing that. I am in Toronto. Maybe once he starts saying, after 10 years, you start thinking about your future. <laughs> then we can think about in it. In Washington. But, in Washington. Yeah, in Washington. Then we can think about it. But as it stands, he's been so clear that it actually would be a shock if he wasn't being completely honest. Yeah, I agree. Look, I mean, I there are so many Raptors rumors that have turned out to not be true. Yeah. So you have to take all these with, you know, a grain of salt, as they say, because I mean, it's just, it just feels like all season long, the rest of the NBA has been these like vultures flying around our team, waiting to pick us apart. And, you know, it's frustrating. And I could see why they want what we have. Right. Yeah. And, and then, then you just kind of think like, man, it's a shame that we couldn't make it work more than it did, because there are so many great individual, you know, people here. So, you know, I, I mean, with all that being said, who knows what we're going to do? But yeah, I, I mean, I, it, they reported it. So I wanted to talk about it. But yeah, I, I don't see Masai just like getting up and leaving. I mean, he just did like that, um, you know the amazing thing with Justin Trudeau about, you know, ending gun violence and stuff. Like he really yeah. doesn't care about the community here. Um, I want to also add that report um, originally from heavy um, Steve Balpit, I believe is the reporter who initially had that scoop. Um, look, I get, he is a columnist, like he's not a nobody, but as someone who's at the games, I've never seen him in Toronto. Like he's not someone who's around Masai Ujiri. Right. And the quote is from a rival GM, not from Masai. Um, this is not someone who's in Toronto, from what I can tell, ever. And so take it with a grain of salt with 
when people who have no connections to a front office are breaking news about that front office. Boom. Boom. There you go. Uh, Lewis, thank you so much for joining me this week. Uh, what are you, what are you up to? Are you just going to enjoy your summer? Like, do you have anything exciting yeah. coming up? Uh, enjoying my summer, still writing about the Raptors. Um, you know, doing less writing because of 538's closure. So no league coverage and the Bucks are out of the playoffs too, which is kind of nice. You know, my wife's a teacher. Um, my son is really, really young, you know, not even two. And so I'm looking forward to having some time this summer to spend as a family. We're going to take him to Ripley's Aquarium. You know, just stuff like that. It's going to be really fun. <laughs> Good old Toronto summer. Uh, Toronto I love summer. It. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll catch you next week. Bye. Bye.